Hello everyone, we're continuing our conversation about the carbon cycle. In the previous video, we did already talk about the carbon cycle and some of the other extra components, for example, hydrogen carbonate ions, methane, and the role that combustion plays within the carbon cycle. So let's take a quick sidestep and link it to kind of our understanding of why we need to worry about extra carbon dioxide going into the air. So what we do know is that there are scientists who are monitoring the carbon levels around the world and in particular we're looking at uh, carbon in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and also in methane. Now methane has a very big impact on global warming but the reason why you don't hear about it so much is because what, car what this methane does is it gets converted into carbon dioxide when it gets oxidized anyways and just makes more carbon dioxide actually in the atmosphere. So in separate videos where we'll, we'll explain what global warming is exactly and how it works it i'd be surprised if you don't have some knowledge about that already so what we do need to know is that the carbon dioxide levels actually fluctuate each year so this little red line here kind of shows how the carbon dioxide levels are going up and down this is due to and it's a good question to ask you so make sure you can try to explain this um, the fluctuations are due to changes in just the seasons, basically. So you can expect that during the summertime, especially because most of our land is in the northern hemisphere, during the summertime, there's going to be a lot more photosynthesis going on. And a lot more photosynthesis going on because of the extra light is actually going to cause a lot more carbon dioxide to be taken in by plants. So we should expect to see some dips, basically, during that time. So that's why you end up with this kind of a uh, pattern basically of, oh, that's very cute. This pattern of these carbon dioxide levels going up and down. But overall, the blue line here is the main trend. And that's what we're talking about by climate change, not changes in weather patterns. But overall, climate change is we're seeing a basically shift for into higher levels of carbon in the atmosphere, which is going to change global temperatures. So overall, we do see a rising trend in carbon dioxide due to human activities. Like I said, in another video, we'll talk exactly about how carbon dioxide as a molecule, what it does with the energy from the sun and why that's such a bad thing and why it's hard for us to stop that. Carbon fluxes, we talked about the word fluxes, meaning kind of we, we showed them as arrows before, showing how that's the direction that the carbon's actually moving. So we can try to estimate approximately how much carbon we're actually talking about. So these are big units we're measuring in gigatons, basically. And as an example here, two examples. Photosynthesis, for example, results in minus 120 gigatons per year of carbon flux. By comparison, when we burn fossil fuels, we're only adding 6.4 gigatons. So you might be thinking, hold on a second, we're only adding 6.4, but the movement in photosynthesis alone is like minus 120. You might be thinking this number is small and insignificant compared to the movement of carbon normally. But the point here is that only small changes are enough to trigger pretty drastic changes in temperature. So you don't have to move. Uh, we don't have to be producing, you know, billions and billions of gigatons just to raise global average temperatures. A small amount is basically all that needs to happen. And so that's why these are some concerns. And we're talking about very large scale changes that are going on here. So continuing our conversation about the carbon cycle and other sources of carbon, if I jump back here really quick, we talked about other sources of carbon in the water in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions, dissolved carbon dioxide. We also talked about methane as a source of carbon being produced by specific types of bacteria called methanogenic archaeans bacteria, which produce methane because they don't have enough oxygen to be able to help them break some of the carbon compounds down. Down. So continuing the conversation and trying to understand another place that we can find carbon is in limestone. So when you go out to the ocean and you hang out and you do some scuba diving or what's that other thing you call? Uh, I don't get in the water very much. Snorkeling. When you do snorkeling and you go to the beach and try to collect some shells and stuff like that, limestone is a material which is called 
calcium carbonate. If you look at the chemical formula, you'll notice there's some carbon in there. So it turns out when things die in the ocean, and those beautiful shells and coral that you're actually looking at used to be living organisms. So when they died, a lot of their body parts that could get broken down got broken down. But the parts that couldn't get broken down were the ones that actually contained some of this uh, fossil type material, which gets trapped and turned into limestone, basically. So what we're basically finding is that a lot of the carbon that that snail used to grow and make its body, once it died, not all of the carbon got returned back into the environment. Some of it is still trapped in its shell there. So what we're basically saying is there's tons of carbon that's actually trapped down there in limestone and with all these shells and coral that haven't coral skeletons that haven't been broken down. But we can start to break it down because it turns out that limestone or calcium carbonate reacts with acids and when you react it with acids it can actually release a lot of that carbon back out into the water and then into the atmosphere as well too so as long as we keep the oceans not so acidic we're okay but then this is why we're talking about it because when we get acid rain and how do we get acid rain by putting extra carbon dioxide into the air my hands are up in the air here i'm trying to show you this with my fingers but i'm not recording my beautiful self so that's quite difficult so anyways, we burn stuff, we put carbon dioxide, extra carbon dioxide into the air, we make acid rain. So there's kind of this positive feedback loop that actually happens. The acid rain comes down, makes the oceans more acidic. The acidic water actually starts reacting with the limestone, which in turn releases even more carbon dioxide out. So you have a kind of a positive feedback loop there. I'm going to put P for positive feedback loop. Let's call that the PFL, the positive feedback loop for limestone. I like positive feedback loops. No, I don't. It's bad. I like talking about that concept. Anyways, I digress. Don't know why this guy is here. I forgot why that is there. What is this? What is this thing called? Mesocosm. Yes, that's good. All right, carrying on. So we're moving on to look at the formation of fossil fuels, another source of carbon. We are talking about the carbon cycle. So try to think about all the places where you can find carbon. So what we're doing these days is we're using a lot of our fossil fuels to power our homes and cars, unless you have a Tesla. But even if you're using a Tesla, it's still better than burning straight up gas. But the electric vehicles, you got to go in and kind of think about, well, where does that electricity ultimately come from? Is there burning of coal or fossil fuels used to produce that electricity? So it's not an argument against the use of electric cars because, yes, that's definitely improvement for all of us. But you got to look at how much are we actually reducing and what can we do to ultimately make ourselves totally fossil fuel free? Because we know this stuff is not going to last forever and I know people have been saying that for a long time but we have to understand how fossil fuels kind of got formed a little bit I'm just going to touch upon it um, a little bit just introduce this vocabulary to you so we know that most of the times if I were to die right here in my office there are bacteria and fungi around that will do a pretty good job at helping me to decay it's going to be pretty nasty uh, my bones will be left over because sadly we can't totally return all of my bone material back into the atmosphere but the bacteria and fungi guy will do a pretty good job at reusing my carbon compounds and then releasing that carbon dioxide into the air but it's also because there's a lot of oxygen around me right now so it turns out if these guys these saprotrophs these fungi and bacteria that are supposed to be helping me to decompose if there's not enough oxygen around if they're in anaerobic conditions or very acidic and anaerobic conditions like swamps, then they can't do full decomposition. And what they end, they end up producing this material called peat. And in the past, this peat basically got compressed and it turned into what we now know today as coal. So when you're coal mining, you got to think about this situation. There just wasn't enough oxygen around or in swamps for anaerobic conditions and acidic conditions, and it made um, the formation of coal possible, and now we're just using it all up. So another place where we actually get fossil fuels turning into oil and gas are, we have to understand what silt is. So here's a nice cool little diagram I found 
right here. Uh, gravel average pieces of sizes right here are shown here in millimeters. Sand, silt, we're talking about really small bits that are even smaller than sand particles actually. So silt deposits on beds of shallow seas, dead marine organisms, eventually uh, that turned into shale and that shale would be converted into oil or gas. And we're running out of this stuff a lot faster than we are of coal. But basically, if you break it down to the simple levels, what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are kind of just the remains of dead things that didn't get fully decomposed. If they got fully decomposed, then it would have just been carbon dioxide added to the air and then it would be part of the carbon cycle and plants would take in that CO2 and everything as well. Um, there but because some of this stuff because of changing conditions on planet earth didn't get broken down the way that nature intended it to we ended up with uh, some pockets of energy stored in not really dead things and now we can burn them and give ourselves energy so that we can cook dead things and eat them more and continue our contributions to the carbon cycle so lots of places so good thing to do right now is i think like take out a blank sheet of paper you know with no notes no video stuff beside you write down carbon or carbon cycle up at the top try to list every single place that you can think of where carbon is found and then try to draw some arrows linking them together and then what you'll be doing is you'll be generating a carbon cycle remember that the arrows of this actual cycle that you're actually trying to produce show the direction that carbon is moving so you got to be careful about that if you're drawing you and a plant you don't draw the arrow from you to the plant that means the plant is eating you that in other words the carbon's going that way so the directions of these arrows are very important i've talked about that in previous videos as well too so here's a nice kind of uh carbon cycle diagram which is a few levels above if we're talking about ib numbers that basic model before was maybe i don't know if you know that stuff you'll be safe with like a level five if you're aiming for like a level six or a level seven you should be able to throw in some of these extra components like where methane fits into everything where carbon dioxide in the ocean plays a role um, understanding limestone in the actual ocean as well too and then knowing a little bit more about how fossil fuels and in kind of a level five diagram you might just see fossil fuels burn combustion carbon dioxide in the air but if we want to go a little bit deeper and understand coal oil and gas and shale understand that it's partial decomposition um, this is kind of a, a level six level seven in terms of ib biology thinking to help you really fully understand this. Now this is still part of the standard level section, but you need to kind of know this at this kind of level, even to score six and seven at the st standard level level. Okay, good luck with everything. Hope you understand some of that stuff. Make sure to test yourself frequently, ask yourself questions, use flashcards. Uh, that's a great idea as well too. Okay, good luck.